Good afternoon. Uh, as Rob mentioned, I'm Amanda Bremer with the Council of Governments. Uh, in particular, I work in the Transportation Department um, on the air quality team. So uh, there's a huge tie to transportation as far as air quality is related. Uh, lots of transportation funding is on the line if we can't get a region into attainment with air quality standards. Uh, so that's part of the reason, reason why air quality falls under transportation in our agency. Um, so in particular, we're going to talk about um, three different topics today, uh, the first being uh, the Barnett Shale Emissions Inventory. This is a study that we did last year, so just giving you some information on our results. Um, and as I mentioned, because we're in transportation, we're focusing strictly on the transportation side of it, uh, vehicles, emissions, and whatnot, not necessarily the life cycle of the emissions from the Barnett Shale. Um, I'll also be speaking very briefly um, about the Texas Low Emissions Diesel Standard, uh, and then Thara is also going to be talking about the Diesel Inspection Maintenance Pilot Program, uh, which we funded last year. Uh, it was in conjunction with COG and the Texas Transportation Institute, uh, looking at emissions coming from the heavy-duty diesel vehicles going down the highway. So in particular, I just wanted to give you some background on air quality, just kind of to set the stage as far as why all these three um, topics are of importance. Uh, right now, we have 10 counties in our region that are in non-attainment for the pollutant ozone. Uh, the region has been in non-attainment since 1991 when these standards came out. Uh, when I say that, it sounds like maybe we've made zero progress if we're still in non-attainment. Uh, basically what the issue is is that we're chasing an ever-moving target. Uh, the standard was very high when it first came out. Every five years, the Environmental Protection Agency looks at the standards to see if they're still applicable to protect human health. Uh, and if not, then they go and determine what the more appropriate standard is. So we are making very significant progress. Uh, unfortunately, we're just not quite there as far as when the EPA thinks that we should be there. Uh, so this map is already out of date because our ozone levels change day by day. Uh, we have eight monitors right now that are considered level orange, um, and so they are not currently meeting the standard. Uh, in order to be in attainment, all of those circles on there need to be below 75 parts per billion. Uh, so we do have quite a long ways to go, um, but only about 10 years ago we were up in the 90s to 100s um, as far as this is concerned, so we have made significant progress there. Uh, as far as how to tackle ozone, uh, ozone is formed when nitrogen oxides and volatile organic compounds combine in the presence of sunlight. Uh, in our region, we're what is known as NOx or nitrogen oxides limited. So that means that is the pollutant that we focus on for most of our control strategies. And so this looks at our emissions inventory for nitrogen oxides, uh, so we kind of understand what sectors we need to focus on to get those emission reductions. And as you can see, almost 75% of our emissions are coming from mobile sources. Uh, your on-road mobile sources, that's going to be pretty much anything that's registered with the Texas Department of Transportation. That's considered on-road. So your cars, your trucks, your 18-wheelers, anything with a license plate is on-road. And then non-road is pretty much the rest of it. Your construction equipment, your locomotives, your aircraft, your lawnmowers, uh, that falls under non-road. And then you have a few more categories, point source, those are going to be your uh, power plants, cement, plant, cement plants. Uh, and then recently we actually broke out area into regular area. Um, that's going to be smaller point sources. Um, it's going to be chemical plants or dry cleaners or whatnot fall under area. But we actually broke out oil and gas uh, because there's been so much uh, activity in our region the last several years that they felt it was necessary to actually break that out. And it does contribute about 5% of the total nitrogen oxides emissions in our region. Um, breaking out just the on-road, just kind of so you understand the magnitude of the on-road side, uh, it's about 55% uh, is attributable to light-duty vehicles, with about 45% attribu attributable to the heavy-duty vehicles. Um, and so this kind of helps us focus on control strategies. Uh, with light-duty, it's more a quantity issue. There are just a lot of cars out there. Uh, the cars themselves are getting cleaner, but we have so many out there that, as a whole, they're contributing a lot to our emissions. Whereas heavy duty, on that side, there aren't nearly as many of those vehicles out there, but a single vehicle is a, going to be a lot dirtier. Um, so with that, we can focus on actual technology controls, um, behavior controls on those heavy duty vehicles to get them to reduce their emissions. Um, so it, it kind of dictates which way we're going to go depending on the sector. So uh, the first topic I wanted to speak to was the Barnett Shale Emissions Inventory. Uh, we received a grant from the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality in 2012 uh, to basically look at the vehicle emissions associated with uh, the sector. Because it is so new, there's not a whole lot of data out there. Uh, so trying to make sure that the models that they have are actually accurately reflecting how much emissions are coming from this, and also to help determine if there needs to be more regulation in that sector. Um, Verifying truck activity with our travel demand model. Uh, the travel demand model is what is used at the Council of Governments to determine our roadway use. Uh, how many vehicle miles traveled are out there, what types of vehicles are out there. 
Um, and then this is also paired with the Texas Department of Transportation's classification counts. So based on registration, they can determine how many of what class, two, three, four, um, class 8A, 8B, light duty, uh, motorcycles, whatnot, they keep track of all that. So we're able to determine the, the mix of vehicles that are out there along with the vehicle counts on the roads to uh, get a good idea of our actual emissions out there due to roadway. And um, that also helps us determine where we're gonna put in new roads, where there's a lot of congestion, where is there a need, um, and whatnot. Uh, they also asked that we incorporate Barnet Shale truck trips um, to estimate the, yeah, sorry, uh, estimate current and projected emissions from Barnet Shale truck activity. Um, so as I mentioned, there's just a lot of activity going on in the Barnet uh, Shale right now. So trying to understand um, what exactly is happening out there. We can make some assumptions as far as where those trucks are going, but those may not actually be the case. Um, so this is a map of our metropolitan planning area. Uh, it's 12 counties. In particular, the Barnett Shale is considered six counties. Uh, so Wise, Denton, Parker, Tarrant, Hood, and Johnson. Um, that's where a majority of all of the Barnett Shale activity is happening. Uh, there's a little bit of the shale that does bleed into the Dallas County um, area, but not a whole lot. And so that's why you're not hearing a whole lot on the Dallas side as far as Barnett Shale goes. The shale just doesn't really extend over there. Um, So this study was a lot of um, literature, literature research. So in particular, we looked at existing reports, uh, presentations and whatnot that were out there to see what have other people already done, to see if we can learn from that, where were their holes, what did they determine was um, an area in which there was more research that needed to be done. Uh, we also looked at the Texas Department of Motor Vehicles uh, through their registration data. And then the Texas Railroad Commission, uh, they're actually the ones that house the data as far as where the wells are. Uh, it may kind of be a, you wonder why does the Railroad Commission care about the wells? We've kind of wondered that too, uh, but regardless, that is where they house all the data. Um, I think they're looking to possibly move that to a different agency within the state, but right now they house all the data related to the, well, to the wells, um, and so that's basically where we get our data is from the Railroad Commission. Um, and then the fourth thing that we did was we actually had conference calls and interviews and surveys with the industry. So we got Chesapeake and some of the other ones together and said, okay, can you please tell us what exactly is your truck activity? How often are you idling? How many trucks do you have? What class of trucks are they? How far are they driving each day? Are they going to the closest well or are they going to a well across town simply because they have a contract with that company? Um, and so the methodology, there are basically four phases uh, that we evaluated. There's the drilling phase, the completion phase, the production phase, and then idling was a fourth component that we looked at. Um, so to determine the activity rates, we did literature reviews for the first two. Um, and drilling is basically where the fracking comes in. That's in the drilling phase. And then completion is when they get, the, um, they get it all ready to actually produce. And then production is when um, there's not nearly as much truck traffic idling at this point. It's more the in and out. Uh, but that's actually where a lot of the region is at this state is actually in the production phase. Um, so as far as emission estimates, I mentioned the travel demand model. That tells us vehicle miles traveled. But as far as how dirty those specific vehicle miles traveled are, that's where we use our MOVES emission factor. Um, this is a model that was developed by the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, basically, this classifies um, each of the vehicles, the heavy duty, the light duty, every, every single class, and there's a, an emission factor that EPA has determined. So we can take that emission factor, plug it into the number of miles for each class and determine what the actual emissions are going to be. Um, and then extended idling, EPA also has idling emission factors, which we were able to use for that as well. Um, we're fairly confident in the extended idling uh, emissions, but the other ones, like I mentioned, there just is not a whole lot of data out there yet. Um, as far as those three phases to fully understand uh, just what exactly the truck traffic is. Uh, we know it's a lot, but what it is, uh, we just don't quite know that yet. Um, as far as the results of the activity, uh, it, there was, the miles nearly doubled since 2006. Uh, that's really when the boom happened, was around 2006, 2007. Uh, so there was a whole lot of activity that's happened since then. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the fracking is already not necessarily behind us, but it has peaked. Uh, and so now a lot of it is just maintaining those wells that they've already fracked. Um, and so the projection between now and 2018 is that there's probably not going to be a whole lot more as far as the vehicle miles traveled go um, compared to what is happening right now. But looking specifically at the roadway type that is getting all these miles, uh, a majority of it is going to be your rural roads. So as uh, you know, one of the previous speakers mentioned, roadways, um, you know, we need to look at them as an asset, not just something that's being consumed. Uh, with these rural roadways, they were not built to withstand the heavy, 
heavy load um, of these Barnet Shale trucks. So they are deteriorating at a significantly higher rate than lots of the other roads are. Um, so they're finding, you know, people that live out in rural areas, they're having a hard time traveling on those roads simply because they are deteriorating so quickly. Um, and those counties don't necessarily have the funds to be able to upkeep or do all the maintenance and upkeep on those roads. Um, so that becomes an issue for sure. Um, and then also, as I mentioned, as far as the results per county, it's Johnson, Tarrant, and Wise um, that have the highest vehicle miles traveled on them right now. Uh, looking specifically at the emissions from this, uh, as I mentioned, NOx and volatile organic compounds, VOCs, uh, those are the two that we're looking at. Um, so looking at the three years, 2012 uh, is the highest projected level as far as the NOx goes, and it will hopefully be decreasing between now and 2018, uh, simply because the shift in what exactly is happening as far as activity. Um, but one of the interesting things to note here is that approximately 60, or I'm sorry, 78 percent of the estimated emissions uh, in 2012 were attributed to extended idling. Uh, you find that a lot of trucks that are going out there are just sitting idling waiting to pick up a load. Uh, they're not turning their vehicles off. They may be waiting four, five, six hours until they have a load to then take um, and either go deposit or take wherever they're going. Um, so there's a huge area uh, that can be impacted um, or can possibly benefit from doing some idle reduction technology out there. Um, these heavy duty vehicles are idling. Uh, they consume roughly a gallon per hour. So if you're idling eight hours a day, five days a week, you know, that's upwards of $7,000 you're wasting just on idling right there. So that's a huge savings when you start considering how many vehicles are running in the region and idling. Uh, conclusions, next steps that came from this. Um, basically, the biggest conclusion was there's a lot we don't know. Um, and so it's been suggested that we go and do a phase two study uh, to, try to get, try to get better uh, ideas of the activity estimates. Uh, try to revise some of the key assumptions on trick, trip lengths, truck route parameters, um, the origin and destination. Uh, the Railroad Commission, as I mentioned, houses this data, but they don't have a very good data set as far as wells that are operational versus wells that are closed, wells that are public versus wells that are private. Uh, and that all comes into play as far as trying to determine where these trucks are going to go. Um, you know, they may not necessarily go to the closest well because it's a private well. They're going to go somewhere else. Um, also trying to refine our model so we can get better uh, emission estimates as well as uh, VMT estimates, and then also the vehicle classification counts, understanding do we actually have a good handle on what exactly the type of trucks are that are out there. Um, in addition, we're looking to do the promotion of idle reduction control strategies. As I mentioned, uh, with nearly three quarters of the emissions coming from idling, that's a huge area that we can actually make an impact on reducing emissions and coming closer to attainment. Um, we've also submitted for some TxDOT research idea projects. Um, and then also uh, we're beginning the initial stages of coordinating with the Eagle Ford shale stakeholders. Um, they're now in the process of um, working on their shale, getting that up to production, and they have a very good working relationship with their industry. So trying to see if there are lessons learned and how do we get a better working relationship with our industry to start making some headway on this. Uh, Lori Clark is my colleague, and she's actually the one who headed this study. Uh, so she can answer a lot more questions than I probably can today. Uh, but there is the report that is available on our website here at nctcog.org slash Barnett Shale. Um, if you want to go download that, it's a pretty good read. Um, but I would be happy to answer any questions on Barnett Shale right now. Uh, the second part I wanted to speak to you about was Texas low emission diesel. Um, this has been around for quite a few years. Uh, basically, the goal of TexLED is to reduce nitrogen oxides emissions from on-road and non-road diesel engines. Um, as I mentioned, NOx is our driving factor, uh, and so this is one way in which the state of Texas thought um, we can try to go about trying to get additional reductions of this pollutant uh, as actually uh, dealing with the fuel that's going into the engines that are burning it. Uh, it is produced for delivery and sale in 110 counties in Texas. Uh, pretty much everything east of I-35 is required to sell Texled now. Um, and it applies to the producers and importers of diesel fuel uh, in one of these 110 counties. And it does apply to both heavy and, duty, heavy light, heavy and light duty uh, vehicles. So anything that uses diesel uh, needs to be using tech sled. Uh, heavy duty diesel fuel, just to give you a little bit of background on this, nationwide uh, there are federal standards related to this uh, for on-road engines, ultra-low sulfur diesel. Um, this was phased in between 2006 and 2010. This is a requirement of 15 parts per million of sulfur. Uh, and then for non-road engines, they had both the low sulfur diesel standard as well as the ultra-low sulfur diesel standard, which is being phased in from 2007 to 2014. 
Uh, one thing to note on ultra low sulfur diesel is it doesn't actually lower emissions aside from sulfur emissions, um, but it simply enables the emission control technology, your diesel particulate filter, uh, your catalytic converter, it enables those uh, advanced technologies to actually work. Otherwise, they get bogged down with all the high sulfur uh, and the previous diesel fuels. So in Texas in particular, uh, regulations requiring tech sled were fully adopted in 2000, um, and then there, there were revisions in 2005. Uh, so basically, the Texas text led rule uh, came out, uh, I guess, to uh, jump ahead of the federal uh, standard. They knew that was coming down eventually, but we needed the emission redu reductions today, and we couldn't wait another 10 years. Uh, so the state went ahead and implemented that rule about 10 years early. And so particularly what is in text led, uh, the first one being the sulfur content. Uh, so basically, it was meeting the, the ultra-low sulfur diesel standard early. Um, now that's kind of a moot point since that ultra low sulfur diesel is required uh, across the board. Uh, so it's pretty much the next two items that really make it tech sled. Uh, so in particular, it has to have an aromatic hydrocarbons less than 10% by volume and a cetane number of 48 or greater. Uh, the second two are really emissions related uh, components. The cetane number, uh, the higher that number is, the higher quality of fuel it is. So it's basically ensuring that there's high quality diesel in the state of Texas. Um, and in particular, TechSed results in a 5.7% reduction of NOx emissions for your on-road engines and a 7% reduction uh, for non-road engines. So that's a very significant reduction. Um, there are some alternative diesel formulations that are allowable in the state if you cannot meet TechSed. Uh, basically, if you can't get your cetane number to 48 or the aromatics, uh, if the end result and emissions can be the same, you can possibly get approved. Um, as an alternative diesel formulation. Uh, the state of California already has their own fuel, which is um, accepted in the state of Texas. They also have alternative diesel formulations uh, that are acceptable, as well as Texled uh, alternative formulations. There's also an alternative emission reduction plan diesel fuel. Uh, this is a bit different than the alternative diesel fuel formulation. Uh, it's just basically going about it in a different way. Um, the state of Texas would have all the details on exactly what that means and how you can get around it. Um, and then the third one is, or the last one is biodiesel. Um, biodiesel is not regulated under TexLED. So basically any blend of biodiesel, um, as long as the diesel portion blend of the biodiesel is TexLED, then that's allowable. Um, but biodiesel is regulated in Texas. It just is under its own statute um, and its own rule. It's not regulated under TexLED. As far as compliance goes, this is all regulated under the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. Uh, they regulate all alternative formulations as well as oversee the compliance and enforcement. Um, they do require quarterly reports from all producers and importers to ensure that they're actually meeting the text led standards. Um, they have allowed commingling of various formulations. So if you have some regular text led, you have some carb um, formulation and you blend those, as long as both those in independently meet TCEQ's requirements, then that fuel would be acceptable. Um, and then the last thing is that TechSled is not required for the end user. Uh, so basically anyone that uses diesel, you are allowed to go purchase non-TechSled fuel, uh, either from one of the non-110 counties or if you go to Oklahoma or whatnot, um, you are allowed to use that in our region. Um, we hope you would not. We'd hope you purchase TechSled simply because the emission reductions uh, as well as paying taxes on that fuel then that helps fund our roadways in Texas. And with that, this is my contact information. Uh, the website at the bottom is for the state of Texas's text led uh, website. If you want any more fun reading, uh, you can go to this website. And I would be happy to take any questions on text led if anyone has any at this time.